Good morning. First, I, uh, we're, we've been short-handed, and a lot of good people have filled in this morning to help me out, so I appreciate that. As I was looking over my notes this morning, thinking about my talk, I made a startling discovery. It seemed like it was a little too complicated and a little disorganized, kind of all over the place. But for those of you who heard me speak before, I guess that's nothing new. What I'm going to talk about this morning is to quote a scripture, a rather controversial one. Tell you about my spiritual journey over the last 10 or 12 years, and then revisit the scripture and tell you what it means to me and how I think it applies to our church. See, I told you it was going to be complicated. So let's get started. The scripture is one you've all heard. It's from James 2.17. Faith without works is dead. Anytime this scripture is brought up in our Sunday school class or Bible study, it produces much debate. Recently, I told Mr. A that if works plays any part in my salvation, then my biggest nightmare would be that I would be standing right behind him in the judgment day line. Hello, fiery sulfur. Actually, there are a lot of people in the church here that I could say that about. Now let's get on to my story. I was raised in this church by two great parents. They were both Christians, and they took the time to teach me all the good stuff. I was baptized here on April 11, 1965, shortly before my 12th birthday. I believe that's 50 years. Let's fast forward to my age 50, <clears throat> where my story begins. My kids were in college, my wife was attending a different church, and I was a part-time attender here at the First Christian. Hadn't been doing any Bible study in several years. I had become what John refers to in Revelation as a lukewarm Christian. And I knew that I needed to change and have a stronger faith in God and be more involved with the church. Just before Dale Carson left the church, he challenged the congregation to read the Bible cover to cover. <clears throat> I don't remember exactly, but I think it required us to read about two or three chapters a day. I knew that I needed to get back to the study of God's Word, so I accepted the challenge, joined the Monday night Bible study, and started coming to Sunday school. This was one of the best things that I ever did. After all, it's impossible to worship God or to trust Him if you don't know His Word. You wouldn't let a stranger take your kids or grandchildren, and you wouldn't invest your money with someone that you didn't know anything about. We need to study God's Word so that we can learn to trust Him and strengthen our faith in Him. And, if you want to study the Word of God, this is as good a place as any. We have great Sunday school teachers here for every age. And if you're an adult, we have three adult classes taught by Pastor Kurt, Wiley Lynch, and Courtney Cox. And they're all great teachers. We also have Monday night and Thursday morning Bible studies. If you're not coming to Sunday school or Bible study, you're missing out on a great opportunity to learn the Word of God. So about this time, I developed a plan. I decided to continue my study of the Word of God and maybe ease into some church activities, maybe serve on a committee. But of course, that's not what happened. Over the next two years, I became an elder, vice chairman, and later chairman of the board. I joined the choir and the men's fellowship and filled in the, at the pulpit a few times since we didn't have a permanent pastor. I guess I didn't know how to say no. And my wife thought I had completely lost my mind. In addition, I was trying to run a business and figure out how to pay for three kids in college at the same time. I was hanging in there pretty well until I became board chairman. We were having a hard time here at the church. We didn't have a permanent pastor and hadn't had one for a while. 
attendance was dropping, and the congregation was divided on the membership issue with strong feelings on both sides. The search committee was working hard, several meetings a week, trying to find us a new pastor, but with little progress. To add insult to injury, the property next door came up for sale. I was working at my office one night, I think it was a Tuesday night, the phone rang and it was a realtor handling the property next door. And uh, she wanted to know if I was chairman of the board, I said yes. She said, well, we, we'd like for the church to have the property, the sales price on is $385,000. And I assured her that uh, we, we would like to have the property, but I also told her, of course, I didn't have the authority to make any kind of offer on the church behalf, and besides, we didn't have that kind of money to make the purchase. Like I said, I was really struggling and very frustrated. I remember reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 a verse that said, In my weakness, he is made strong. I remember thinking, God must re really be thinking, feeling strong tonight, because I sure do feel weak. I don't know about you, but I don't like to admit that I'm weak. I guess maybe I was getting a little humility lesson too. About this time, things began to turn around here in a big way. The Holy Spirit began to work in our church. The choir sings a, call, a song called On Time God. And the chorus says that he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. Personally, I thought he was running a little late, but I sure was glad to see him. short time later, the search committee interviewed our best prospect today. We were encouraged enough to ask him to come and do a sermon for us. By then, we had an interim pastor, and when I told him of our plans, he said, don't bother, you're wasting your time. He's been offered a position at a large church in Payne, Illinois, near his hometown, and they will probably pay him at least twice what we can afford to pay him here. Well, we decided to have him come anyway. We listened to his sermon, which was great, and we hired him on the spot. After we hired Pastor Kurt, we were able to get past the membership issue. The next thing that happened was pretty amazing as well. Remember the property next door with $385,000 price tag? Well, one day Don Browning called Pastor Kurt and was all excited. He had gotten weeks down to $80,000 for the property next door. We called a special board meeting to see if we wanted to put it to a congregational vote to purchase the property. Someone asked where we would get the money, and Keith Craft, our treasurer, spoke up. He said, well, he said, a, a kind of a funny thing has happened. He said, all that time we didn't have a pastor where we weren't paying a pastor's salary and insurance and taxes. He said, we saved quite a bit of money. Somebody said, well, how much did we save, Keith? And of course, he said, $80,000. <laughs> so we bought the property. The next problem we had was that the building needed to be torn down, and that would cost several thousands of dollars that the church didn't have. And, of course, an anonymous donor came forth and paid for that. So we've been blessed around here at the First Christian Church for the last many years. And I believe the Holy Spirit has been hard at work here. So now, let, <coughs> excuse me. So now let's get back to the scripture, faith without works is dead. What has that got to do with my story? Well, if you go back to my initial statement, I was seeking a stronger faith and wanting to get more involved with the work of the church. And by returning to the study of God's Word and being here and seeing the work of the Holy Spirit, my faith was increased, and as a result, so were my works. Mission accomplished. Now, I know I still have a long way to go, but at least I got started. So, are we saved by works? According to Paul, the answer is no. 
in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul tell, tells us, By grace you have been saved, and that is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of works, so no one may boast. Also, we're told in John 19, that before Jesus took his last breath, he said, it is finished. In other words, he had paid our debt in full. Nothing was required from us. Our salvation is a gift from God. It's a gift. If someone gives you a gift, you're not expected to do anything and work for it. It's a gift. If you have to work for it, it's not a gift. So does that mean that our works are not important? Absolutely not. We're saved by God's grace for works, not by works. Jesus had more faith in the Father than anyone. He said, I can only do what the Father tells me. He spent his entire ministry doing work for the Father, teaching, healing the sick, raising the dead, so on and so on. He had the strongest faith, which produced the greatest works. What James seems to be saying is that if you have great faith, we will see it in the works that you do. And if you have a weak faith, you won't produce much in the way it works. What would James say about the faith of the first Christian church? A couple weeks ago, Pastor Kirk, uh, his last sermon was bragging on us. He said he was proud of us. We did great works last year. We did great works with the youth groups. Our attendance increased. Fundraising for the fellowship was great, and on and on. So I think James would say that all those good works that we do prove that our faith is increasing. So as we approach fall, there will be many new projects here at the church that demand our faith and our works. There is much to, to be done. So before I close, let me give you one final thought. When you get that phone call, someone from the church asks you to help out on a project or to be on a committee, before them, you tell them yes or no, just remember, either way, your faith is short.